Namaskar and welcome to another 9 p.m. live. Our topic today is uh, has India changed uh, since 2014? Okay, now that's the topic part of it. You know, today I'm I'm excited. I'm excited because in our profession, especially in this uh, political journalism business, you don't get to talk to creative legends. You know, uh, you don't get to meet creative legends and talk to creative people and all that. So today I'm excited. I've got a creative legend who comments on politics and social issues as effectively as her creativity. We have Mallika Charapai today and we're going to talk to her. Let's get right into the show and let's have a chat with her. What a pleasure to have you on my show, Malika. And I was just telling my audience that uh, it's not often that we uh, political journalists get to talk to personalities like you. So I'm quite honored and I'm very happy. Malika, I'll start my question with a creative uh, uh, point of view. You see, um, I remember creativity, I think whatever little I knew about it was about uh, great stories, uh, beautiful representations, uh, lovely uh, themes, uh, concepts. Somewhere down the line, what we see now is creativity now is about vaccine, about Narendra Modi, about, uh, you know, about uh, uh, political ideologies. Has creativity infested politics or has politics infested creativity? What really has happened? I think the greatest infestation is fear. We are a nation of terrified people. We are a nation of people who look behind our shoulders all the time, who are careful of what we say, even amongst our closest friends. We are afraid of the next tap on our door. We are afraid that anything we say, somebody is going to take a fragment and you will be pilloried for it. I have always grown up to think of my art as a language. And I have used it as that. I have used my art to talk about things that concern me. And those are things that can range from the fear in our lives to climate change, to violence against women, to human rights abuse and all of that. And it is as though anything can trigger a volley of hatred and a volley of government handedness that is meant to crush you, to silence you. And I think when creativity gets married to the handouts of the rich and the powerful, when your grant demands that you toe the line, that you bow to the gods that are chosen, that you never question, that you produce hagiography, then the greatest creativity lies in how you take something that is true and how you roll it up and make it something that is not. I think this nation's greatest creativity is going in there. Does your creativity inspire your activism? I don't see the two as different. Just as I'm speaking to you in English just now, I could get up and do something in dance if I thought it would be more effective in communicating with you. I would. I would get up and perform, I would do a pirouette, I would do a cartwheel if I thought that my point was getting through to you better that way. So what I want to say is what drives the language that I use. And what I want to say is a lot. What I want to say is, give me back my country, give me back my constitution, give me back the power of the people to be democratic, to have not the fear, but the joy of being listened to, because we know that the people we elect care. 
that's what I want to talk about. And perhaps I'm allowed and perhaps I'm not. Specifically speaking, what what is the difference that you see from where you, when you were young and, 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 and the India before 2000 possibly and the India after 2014 and the India of today? What difference do you see? You must know the story about the frog that is kept in cold water and then the water is gently heated and the frog doesn't know till it's too late that it's a boiled frog. That is where India is. I think the fact that I start by speaking about fear is something that I never could have imagined. Living in Gujarat and being pilloried for wanting justice for the Muslims who were massacred or raped in 2002, I have known fear. But it is a very personal fear for a stand that I took, for a stand that I took because I thought that is what every Indian's right is, to be treated justly and equally. But this all-pervasive fear is something that is very new and very post-2014. With all the huge corruptions and the big malafides of the Congress governments, I could speak my word. I could say whatever I wanted. Of course, they banned books. Of course, they banned some films. But by and large, artists could write, could sing, could dance, could act against the government, questioning the government, questioning policies. That has completely changed. The fact that it's either with me or against the country, that is new. The plurality has gone. We have taken on one color and are stamping out the little shoots that perhaps don't grow like this, but grow like this or grow like this or grow like this or want to twist and grow like this, that's gone. I think, I think the debasement of the common Indian is what comes through. The complete disdain, arrogance, the lack of humility, the lack of humaneness, compassion, for the terrible suffering that our people are going through, the, the constant talking of bigger, better, bigger, stronger, bigger, when everybody underneath is bearing the, bearing the trauma of being trampled upon, that is different. The complete impunity of calling people the most horrendous names, of, of, of telling them what to wear and what not to wear and what to eat and what not to eat and whom to fall in love with, but not whom to hate. That is told to us. Everything else is questioned. That is new. The kind of vigilante justice that the government takes, the police takes, that is new. For me to be afraid that tomorrow I might be lynched because of something that is in my bag that is not even what it is they think it is. That is new. The celebration of the obsession with wealth is new. My being told that I can't pick up a stone and say, as a Hindu, this is my goddess, that is new. Listen, I am not saying everything was hunky-dory and paradise before 2014, not at all. There was so much that was wrong with every government. But this complete destruction of what I call my Indianness, that I can wear two different earrings in two years and nobody can say to me why, that I can wear a kachi kapra stitched onto a kurta and nobody can say why because it's all my heritage. My heritage is the world's heritage, but India has so much heritage that all that is mine. Why should I be told that only if my nose is a certain shape am I Indian? Why am I being asked to prove that I am Indian? I am Indian to the last core of my genes. How can anybody ask me, why should I prove 
can 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 love be proved? Can loyalty be proved? Can genuine love be proved? Of course not. What do I do? Like the famous Hanuman picture that Hussein has drawn, open my heart and show that my gods are within me. I can't. And why should I? All that is new. All that is different. And like the frog that will one day find it's boiled and dead, we are very close to that. Are you aspiring a very idealistic life? Uh, you know, a lot of people say that what you just said is so idealistic. So correct. So this is how the world should be. But unfortunately, that's not the way the world is, isn't it? There are stages of hatefulness. There are stages of cruelty. There are stages of viciousness. There are stages of violence. There are stages of abuse. You can't say that abuse is not abuse because this abuse is worse. You can't say, oh, but the Sikh riots were terrible, so why blame us about the genocide in Gujarat? The Sikh riots were terrible. But after that, the Sikhs were not destroyed. The Muslims are destroyed. That is the difference. And just because horrible things have been done in the past, that doesn't justify our doing horrible things today. And what is wrong with idealism? That is what this world lacks is idealism. It's all practicality, practicality. If you don't dream of the ideal, then how can you even take the first step? Of course, I dream of the ideal world. I dream of a world where our villages will be powerhouses of innovation, where our farmers will be in businesses that don't allow them to sell things at throwaway part prices because they, in their villages, have cooperatives which are value adding to their products. I am hoping for that. I am not hoping for an urbanized India where 75% of the people live in complete lack of dignity in slums that are slovenly, horrible, and, and, and kill you, kill your dignity, kill every sense of the self. That is not the India I want. That is not the world that I want. I do want an India where I can walk free on the street without saying, I am a woman, I will be raped, I will be molested, somebody will come and grab my breast. If that is an ideal world, yes, I dream of an ideal world. If my not having to look at a Dalit going down a sewer is an ideal world, yes, I want an ideal world. I, I really appreciate what you just said. Um, let me ask you another question. You see, uh, uh, is the search for ideal world uh, taking you to different places. Uh, what I mean by that is you were uh, quite close to Atal Bihari Vajpayee. You had a very good, you shared a very good relation with him. Uh, you worked uh, a lot on uh, various projects of uh, Bharatiya Janata Party, uh, social projects, a lot of social projects in Bharatiya Janata Party. And then you, then you contested against uh, LK Advani. Then uh, you joined up and something that uh, I think some uh, six leader, hours, for six, six hours. hours. <laughs> Correct. Correct. But something that some leader said and you, you quit up. My question is uh, not really about AAP or BJP. My question is, uh, are you searching for something that uh, is just evading you? And if that is the case, what are you searching for? I'm searching for a compassionate world. I'm searching for a world where each human being can live with dignity. And to my dying day, I will work towards that in whatever little way I can. You know that that electoral campaign against Mr. Advani was the greatest learning experience I have known of how people's eyes can be covered by wool for years and years on end. You know, this, this adage that says you can fool people for a certain time, but not for, I don't believe that. I think you can fool people into numbness. I went from village to village in my constituency. The constituency had been electing Mr. Adwani for, I think, 20 years before that. They had never seen him. He had never actually come and lived in Ahmedabad or Gandhinagar ever. When I started going from village to village, I have a room full of notebooks 
of notes I took from the millions of people I met, from the lakhs of people I met. I know whose pool gets flooded and the children can't go to school. That is the kind of politician I want to elect. Somebody who actually has the grassroots and their back. Which politician today of any color has our back, has the back of your chauffeur or has the back of your cleaning lady? Is that illusive? No, I don't think it's illusive at all. I don't think it's illusive. I think if enough people were to get up and act, if enough people, you know, I ran a project, a, a performance project called Ansuni based on Harsh Mandar's book, Unheard Voices. Because when my kids were growing up, I was horrified to listen to their friends who thought that the greatest uh, quandary in the world was to choose between one shoe brand and another. And I thought, you know, we talk of the dividend of youth, but if this is the youth and they have no idea what India is, what India's issues are, what the reality is, then how are they going to become leaders of either the corporate world or politics? So we did this and we took this performance to 120 elite schools and colleges. And what we managed to do is get 7,000 people, children, volunteering for change. And it could be very, something very small, like I would say to them, do you have a maid and da, da, do her children require help in maths and science? Can you teach your maid how to clarify water so that she doesn't get sick? That is change. That is volunteering for change. Surely we can do that. Why do we say government nahi karti? We can do it. We are not dead. Each and every person. Nobody is in such a wretched position that they can't help somebody else. I mean, how many stories we have in our mythology of the last roti being given to somebody who comes hungry at the door? So where is that Hinduism? Where is that compassion? What Hinduism are we talking about? This Hindutva is nothing to do with Hinduism. It's the most Abrahamic of philosophies. Compared to the person you contested, that's L.K. Advani, uh, who do you rate better, uh, Mr. L.K. Advani uh, or uh, Mr. Narendra Modi? Better in what sense? Better in administration, better as a prime minister. L.K. Advani could have been no, a prime Mr. minister. Advani. Vajpayee was a great statesman. I think we have had very few statesmen after that. Correct. I think when you talk about statesmanship and you talk, you start with Panditji, uh, it was a different ilk. Now the photo op is the only thing that matters. How many clothes I wear, how many different positions I get um, photographed with, how many places are my photographs on. Do you think Vajpayee did that? I think if you want somebody within the BJP, with an RSS background, who was a statesman, it was Atalji, without a doubt. Fair enough. But still, my question remains, LK Advani compared to uh, uh, Modi ji, who you think I, would be? I think Modi ji is perhaps the world's best photo op and social media person. I mean, Compared to him, all our thespian activities pale in comparison. We are just nothing. And I think his steadfastness in whatever his aim is, and we know what his aim is, his 24-7 approach in pursuing that one goal is very hard to compare with anybody else. So in that way... Mr. Modi comes out number one in his mission and to achieve what he wants to achieve. There is nobody to compare. Fair enough. I got my answer. You know, one more thing. In 2009, today, you know, in the last couple of uh, weeks, months actually, we've been covering electoral bonds, continuously covering electoral bonds. And I was doing my research for some other show and I realized in 2009, you had spoken about transparency in elections. You had spoken about transparency in actual electoral politics, and you had uploaded a lot of your uh, your expenses. Everything, everything, everything. Last rupee received, last rupee spent. You know, Sujit, I have to tell you something. Please. For so after two thousand and two, I decided that I wanted to create a group of people who couldn't care less about politics, who would only concentrate on governance. Because I think what this country lacks is governance, is good governance, is, is, is actually delivering to the last person. 
So I went around the country asking people to give me seven years of their time, to give me two years where we could get known in our constituency, whatever constituency we chose. We could actually help people. We could actually do things to make their lives easier. Then we would stand. And I thought that if I had 200 such people, and if even 30 got elected to the parliament, we would be a huge swing. And I said to everybody, listen, we will never get re-elected again because we are not going to scratch anybody's back. We're not going to let anybody scratch ours. So as far as the powers are concerned, we will be hugely unpopular. But if we can only show that even within the system as it stands today, it is possible to alleviate poverty, it's possible to give employment, it is possible for the farmers to live with dignity, it is possible to women to do whatever they need to do, it's possible for the panchayat to have the kind of women leaders that are possible, then we will have made a chance. After all those years, from 2002 to 2009, nobody joined me, which is when I was persuaded to throw in the towel, at least to show that an election could be fought as it should be fought, that you could be completely, completely transparent and still be able to fight. Why didn't you uh, uh, contest again? Because I realized that it's an old boys club and money and power and sheer muscle power are so, so important and get stronger by the day and more important by the day that it is hopeless for an independent unless one stands in some obscure place which is completely out of everybody's thing. Look at how many independents have been elected from the first parliament to today. It's all about muscle power. And I have to also tell you that when it came to somebody like me standing, the Congress and the BJP became an old boys club. So so that none of my Achar Sahita breaks that Mr. Advani did talking about Brahminism, talking about Hinduism at public lectures going completely against the moral code, nothing would be taken into consideration. And I would do something, something and the whole uh, police would be at me, the election commission would be at me and trying to stop me about doing anything. So. It's not possible to fight as an independent. There is not a single party that I think today I would like to put my name to because I don't believe in skeletons in the closet. And I think integrity is so important in everything that unless I come in with integrity, there's no point in doing it. Let me fight as an artist. Let me sensitize people. Let me reach them through your show so that even if two people decide, yeah, maybe she's talking some sense. Maybe we can make a difference. Maybe we must raise our voice against the tyranny that surrounds us, the terror that surrounds us, the complete destruction of Indianness that is happening. Maybe that will be two more people. Yeah, you have a, a, a viewer right now, Berna Iglesias, if, I get, if I'm reading right, Berna Iglesias says, ma'am, seriously, I would like to join you. So you have uh, viewers right now, right here uh, offering you. But tell me something, uh, you are not an ordinary independent candidate for crying out loud. I mean, let's be clear, let's be real. You are a celebrity. You, you People know you worldwide. So it, it can't be as simple as an independent standing in a constitution, in a constituency, my apologies. It is. Let me tell you, it is. And since 2009 till today, it must have become a million times worse. I mean, we we can't even get our VV Pat slips out with with the election commission. What is everybody so afraid of? If you're saying that our electronic voting machines are completely honest, why are we afraid to have it counted? I mean, if the election commission, I mean, I knew Session very well. Where have we fallen to? Where really have we fallen to? Session and then people like Lingdo. And look at where we are. I mean, what, what chance does anybody with honesty and integrity stand today? Anybody who wants to actually genuinely make change. Tell me, with all the money that is being poured over the last 75 years into development, had a government really wanted to empower people, surely they would have succeeded.
But governments do not want people empowered because empowered people are people who ask questions, who demand answers, and who can bring you down if you suddenly switch a party and sit on a chair because I've got a, I've got a, a ticket to contest. I mean, my God, how can how? I mean, that that goes against everything. They are supposed to be disqualified. The minute they jump a party, they have lost their member of parliament or MLA seat. What rules are we talking about? How can one fight this? One has to fight it only as a voter, not by standing, because one doesn't have a standing. I always thought you were born empowered. I mean, you were born to two great legends. You were born to Mr. Vikram Sarabhai. You were born to, uh, 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 you know, your, your mother uh, was a legend, a, a, a artist. You were born to legends. Uh, and. Uh, 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 you yourself are a legend. So, how did it feel? I mean, how does it feel? This is a stupid question, I know, but I I want to ask you: How does it feel to be uh, to be born to such legends and to be a legend yourself? To, how does it feel? To I don't know about my being a legend, but to me, Amma and Papa were just Amma and Papa, and uh, you know. I think that parents pressure children into a particular mold if they themselves are frustrated. I think both my parents were so fulfilled in what they did that they didn't pressurize my brother Karthikeya or me into doing anything. And I often laugh at Kar with Karthikeya and I say to him that, you know, Papa and Amma must be both laughing because they would say, uh, you know, basically we are people who work for development. And what are you and your brother doing? He's working through the environment. You are working through the arts. But basically what you are doing is trying to make for a better nation, a better world. And uh, so we didn't pressure you, but you got there. Tell me, uh, where did you, how come you became an artist? Uh, why did you, I mean, how did you follow your mother? Why not a scientist? Why, why did you choose? Uh... I'll tell you why not a scientist. It's very clear why not a scientist. I love chemistry. I love maths. But in my time, if you wanted to go into science, you had to cut a frog physically. And that was something I couldn't do then. I will not be able to do now. Lucky children, now they do it virtually. But in my times, you actually had to cut a frog. And I thought, ye humse nahi hoga. I didn't want to be an artist. I saw how hard my mother worked. I saw whether she was well or sick or whatever. If there was a show, she danced. And I said, ye bhi humse nahi hoga. So I wanted to be a demographer. I went into management. I wanted, I had a dream with my father of when I finished my IM, Papa would retire from the government and we would set up institutions that helped the most vulnerable people health institutions, educational institutions, scientific institutions. But that was not to be. Papa died a day before I took my IIM entrance exam. Uh, and it was, I had always learned how to dance. I had always learned theater, I had always learned dance, puppetry, music. But it was much later going through a severe depression and feeling completely nihilistic that one day I woke up with this Eureka moment that I want to dance. And for Amma, it was a second innings because she had, after Papa died, um, not really wanted to continue dancing. And we forced her to continue dancing. So five years later, when I went into dance, it was really a wonderful 20-year partnership of Amma's and mine. And it was, uh, it was incredible. It was an incredible spiritual experience for both of us. Who inspired you more, Mr. Vikram Sarabhai or Mr. Mrs. Miranda Sarabhai? Do I prefer my right hand or my left? <laughs> okay. Tell me, um, one of your famous uh, plays on uh, musicals that you've staged is uh, Sita's Daughter. What, what, what were you trying to communicate through uh, that particular uh, play? What exactly did you as an artist want to stage, want to uh, emphasize, profess? You know, in Hinduism, traditionally, all the gods are known as their goddesses man. Siya Ram, Sita's Ram, Uma Shankar, Uma's Shankar, and so on. And I always wondered if Sita was born in a yagna out of the earth, she could not have been the woman that she's been made out to be docile, not questioning, sorry for herself, jumping into the fire when asked to jump into the fire. 
I kept thinking our goddesses cannot have been like that. So I tried to see their life from her point of view. What would she have thought? What would she have done? And my Sita, and I can't perform it anymore because I would be probably killed. Uh, my Sita says that I'm happy to be free of you because now I can bring up my sons to be secure and trusting. And for me, every woman who looks at her life and questions and has the capability of standing up against the greatest pressures is the daughter of Sita. So I then go into a doctor, a woman doctor who stood up against amniosynthesis being used for killing of girl children. I studied a thousand rape cases and made a rape case where a woman teacher raped by a Brahmin headmaster um, said to him, one day I will get you. One day I will stand behind in front of a judge and I will bring this story out. These are women of incredible courage. Uh, they were not case studies, but I studied a lot of doctors. I interviewed, for instance, on this whole female feticide things, I interviewed 40 doctors to ask them why they committed female feticide or why they led, uh, gave the information that led to female feticide. And all of them, except this one woman doctor said, Paise banane hai, tum bana lo ya kor all bana lega. And this was in 1990. And I talked about women and nature. I talked about the Bishnois. I talked of Amrita Devi and then the Chipko movement. And I talked about this extraordinary Hindu ritual called Dohada, where young girls are asked to kick a tree to make them blossom. And I end by saying, make the daughters of Sita blossom everywhere. I've done it 600 times close to in Gujarati, Hindi, and English. I have done it across countries. I have done it for eight multiple rape victims under a tree in the desert of Kutch. I have done it for 8,000 beauty workers in Anand. I have done it. Uh, it was compulsory viewing for a university, for SNDT University. Every girl who graduated had to write a paper on it. It has been taught in American universities. Uh, when Sharad Pawar was the chief minister, he made it compulsory that every new group of district magistrates be sensitized by my performing Sita's daughters for them. And I can't do it today. That's Tell your me. answer of what has changed. Yes. Yes. You know, uh, uh, Shakti is used as a catchphrase today by a lot of politicians. Okay, so Shakti has become a unique selling proposition or a brand proposition as they call it for a lot of politicians. What is your definition of Shakti? I am a Shakta, I have to tell you. I am a follower. For me, Shakti is the embodiment of everything that we categorize as male or female, positive or negative. And it points to the fact that each of us has the ability to do anything we want and the ability to choose the dark side of ourselves or the light. And for me, it is that inward journey that I do every day to find the compassionate, to not become uh, what society is making me into a dark, untrusting, uh, self-centered, um, hating person. To me, Shakti represents all of that. Shakti represents the need for justice and the fight for justice. And Shakti also represents both the male and the female in me. Before I end my show, I want to talk about that phase of your life, 2003, 2004, 2005. I guess there were a series of cases against you. How did you cope up with that phase of life? And, and did it make you stronger? Because you seem to be talking. You, you are not afraid. You, you're not scared. So can you tell me about that phase of your life? Sujit, I come from a family where three generations of women fought for justice. Whether it is my aunt Lakshmi Sehgal, or whether it was my aunt Mridula Sarabhai, who dressed as a Pathan, went during partition to Pakistan and India, helping women get back to their families. Or whether it was 
my great aunt Anasuya Sarabhai, who started the first labor union here. I think they would all be so ashamed if I was afraid or if I let my fear take me over. About the years following 2000, yes, there were a multiplicity of cases filed against me. I had a couple of people in my life who then gave me and continue giving me the strength and are my compass because I can also get very disappointed, very dejected. I can also want to give up. And like all those lakhs of high network individuals who are fleeing this country for the last 10 years, this non-high network person can also flee. But I will not cede my country. I will not cede my city. I will not. And whatever, whatever has to happen will happen. My becoming a coward and not a seeker of truth and justice is not going to make me like myself when I wake up in the morning. If I have a voice, I must use it. I must use it for all those who do not have a voice, who do not have the luxury that I have of sitting here talking to you and being heard. If I, if I throw that away, what worth is my life? What worth is my destiny? What worth is my genetics? What worth is my education? It isn't worth it. It really isn't worth it. it my life would be worthless. You know, every time a Chandrayaan goes up, we remember the Sarabhais. India owes it to them. India owes a lot to your family. Nilanadi Sarabhai actually uh, 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 profess, uh, actually taught us what stage is, what, what taking art to different places is. A lot is owed to the Sarabhai family. Do you think uh, India has been grateful to your family? Does it matter? As long it as does. I... No, it, it does. To an Indian, it does. I'm asking yes, you as an Indian. Have we been grateful to you? I get so much love and so much tenderness from so many unexpected people on the road. When I was being hounded by the Gujarat government, I was in a crowded, crowded place. And I felt somebody hold my hand and squeeze it and say, thank you for fighting for us. That's the kind of thing that keeps me going. So, yes, I think there is a lot of love and a lot of gratitude. It can never be measured. What is enough? Money is never enough for most people. I think I get the love that I that nourishes me. I think Papa and Amma would also feel the same. When I meet somebody in Timbuktu and she comes up to me and says, you know, I learned with your mother. I've never danced after that. But every crisis in my life I have dealt with because of the years I spent with her and in learning dancing. You know? It, it depends on what, what is it that you want of life. What kind of a person do you want to be and what kind of a person do you want others to be? What is your expectation of life? Is your expectation of life having so much money that you can't sleep at night because it's the thing somebody is going to poison you? Or is it that I have to have a million security people around me because I think I'll be shot? To me, that's not what it's about. So we make our choices. I think, I think the thing is to ask yourself every day whether you are living your own script or somebody else's. I'm certainly living mine. You know, Mallika, I do a lot of interviews. I interview almost every evening. Every 9 o'clock, I have guests. Very few times when I have people who are so well articulated as you are and who express it so beautifully. Thank you so much for being in my show. Thank you so much for talking to me. What a pleasure. Thank you.